When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His throne in glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand, and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And and when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are cursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they also will answer, Lord, When was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. Thank you, and you may be seated. I want to echo something Tony said about this. Uh, He's already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, So this is your second commercial. Um, The first thing I want you to know, this is a rather expensive piece compared to what we usually print. And half of it was donated by somebody that really wants you to help take the good news out into the world. But it was given as an honor gift to all these people who work so hard on these programs. All the people that put so much time and effort to do and prepare the things that you see talked about inside this work. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm really serious about this. You're going to get one in the mail, but you take this one and you pray about who you should give it to. And you pray because this is the season when some people just go to church when? When? Christmas and Easter. And this is what is coming up now about to start next Sunday. Advent, getting ready for, come on, Christmas. And so some of those folks that don't come all year, you can stand around and fuss about it. That's not what you're called to do. You are called to share the good news with them. We have an opportunity. I don't look at that time as an opportunity to fuss at people for not coming the rest of the year. I look at it as an opportunity, thank God, I have a chance to share the gospel with them in some way, at least during that time of the year. And I want you to see it that way. I want you to pray about who you will give this to. And I want you to support. Wasn't the choir wonderful this morning? Weren't they? Would you express that to them? They're awesome. And wasn't that duet just terrific? It was awesome. That, that duet was just awesome. Our music program is a part of those who have worked so hard. We have so many others who are getting ready for all the wonderful things from the Messiah on, things that are coming up that are, we can be a part of to bring us closer to Christ. And it tells about that in this publication. And so give it away. Give it to a young family, give it to an older person, give it to a middle-aged person, give it to somebody that you prayed about that maybe this will be the time when the Holy Spirit will touch their life. So, you can be an instrument. You don't even have to be in one of the programs to do that. All you have to do is be an instrument. 
that takes your hand and puts that in somebody else's. Now, you do have a little thing that you can keep on your, um, on your refrigerator. So if you give both of your copies away, we'll try to find you another one and let you give it away too. And, and we'll just assume that the Lord is calling you to spread the good news in this way. Um, a prophet is not without... Is that the way it goes? Or does it go... Uh, a prophet is only understood with the people who understand it. A prophet is not without honor in their own country. Is that one? Or a prophet is only heard by the people who are used to listening to him. Which one of those? This one, isn't it? A prophet is not without honor except in their own country. It's very difficult to be a prophet. Nobody liked for the prophets to come to town in the Old Testament. In fact, prophecy was one of those things when people heard, they knew that the coming of God, and I want you to hear this, the coming of God is always judgment. The coming of God is always judgment. It's judgment for the righteous and it's judgment for the unrighteous. The difference is that judgment, as we read about in Matthew chapter 25 today, for the righteous offers them the opportunity to come closer to God. Judgment, when it comes upon us, brings us nearer to the presence of God or it sends us away. If we reject it, if we refuse to receive it, we go the other direction. A lot of times, and I've been guilty of this too, in Matthew 25, we want to make the distinction between, well, what was it about the goats and what was it about the sheep? Why are the sheep chosen and the goats are not chosen? And that has nothing to do with the story. It, it might make a good point for a Sunday school lesson. It might make a good point for a sermon, but it has nothing to do with the story. What this story is about is that Jesus knows those who are His. Jesus knows those who are His. And the Bible teaches us that when Jesus judges us, when God judges us, in Hebrews it says when hardships and trials come upon you, it's to form you so that you can become God's own. Because God loves us, He allows us to go through those things. Sometimes we read the Old Testament and it's all about war and death and dying and all of those things that are so strange to life because we know that none of us are ever going to be in war and death or dying, right? No, wrong. We're all a part of war and death and dying. The world is a part of that. And it's far too easy for us in our cloistered world on this side of the ocean sometimes who are protected from the difficulties of life to think that we're the blessed ones without hearing what Jesus said to you and to me, that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for us to get into heaven. Oh my goodness. You mean that verse really applies to you and to me? It does. It's as if, and, and Browning says this in one of his books, he said it's as if it's impossible for the wealthy to get into heaven, but that's the point. We can't get into heaven on our own good works, on our own ability to be righteous, but we get there because of God's grace, just like everyone else. However, there is a judgment. Even though God's grace is abundant and offered to all of us, we are not left without judgment coming upon us if we are callous to our brothers and sisters who are less fortunate than we are, who have less than we do. And whether that less, it means that they have less of this world's goods, or whether they don't know the good news of Jesus Christ and we just don't bother to tell them. We don't bother to give them a good word or an invitation or tell them about God. I think sometimes churches grumble because we don't have enough good to talk about. We grumble and we gripe and we complain about this and that. I want to tell you, and I promise you this is true, if you will try it for six weeks and it's not true, you come tell me and I'll stand up and admit I'm a liar. But I believe it, I've seen it for the last 50 years that if you lead somebody to Christ, if you win somebody to Jesus, you'll talk about that. It will fill your heart up. It will bless you. And your cup will overflow. And if you're not part of doing that in the church, then you're going to worry about how the church is doing this and why it's doing that and how your needs are being met or not being met. 
But if you let God work through you for good to somebody else, that's what you're going to think about. That's what you're going to talk about. And if that's the prophet's word, let it be so today. Um, when the prophet would come to town, people would be a little bit apprehensive. Prophets stayed away from town. They kind of lived on their own. They were out there. Uh, when Samuel came to town, Jesse heard he was coming, David's father, and he sent word, sent two of his warrior sons, listen to me, two of his warrior sons, two soldiers, and said, go ask the prophet if he's coming in peace or not. In other words, if he's not coming in peace, we better get ready to fight. Things are tough. The prophet always brought judgment. God's word brings judgment. The, the difficulty for us is that we want to believe that judgment is something in the future. The truth is, is that the judgment that God brings on us is something right now. Sometimes we have the opportunity that we see things right now more clearly than we will as we look back than we will by looking to the future. People just love future prophecies, don't they? They get all carried away about this or that and when it's going to happen. I've been guilty of that at times in my life too. And the reality is that, that doesn't cost us anything. That doesn't reshape us. But when I see how God's hand has been working in my life or yours, that shapes us. Robert Capon says that you cannot get God off the hook for natural disasters. That the God who created the world is responsible for Katrina and responsible for the tornadoes that blew through Tuscaloosa and that blew north of us and destroyed communities and cities. He created the world. God created the world with the possibility of tornadoes, with the possibility of hurricanes, with the possibility of tsunamis and natural disasters. And to dismiss that as if God has nothing to do with it is foolishness. Listen to me. That may not be comfortable in sophisticated modern society who would like to say, my God is not like that. But this is the God of the rough and tumble world that we live in. The only reality, Capon says, is that the hook is the cross. And that God's answer to the suffering of the world was not to remove the suffering, but to show us how to live within that suffering by sending Jesus to suffer and die for us to say then, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here is the greater foundation for us as Christians, is that death is not the end. Death is not final. And whether it comes by Katrina or through a natural disaster like that or whether it comes through disease or old age, it doesn't matter. Death comes to us all. And Jesus answers that issue. Jesus has already settled that. So the worst thing in life is not to die. That's not the worst thing in life. The worst thing in life is to be alive and never see the hand of God at work in this world. I had to do a lot of driving the last couple of days, that, and so I was on the road last night, got in later than my usual time, and a lot of you know that Saturday for me is kind of Sabbath, and I don't really like to do anything on Saturday because it's the day when I get ready for Sunday. So I was praying while I was driving and saying, God, help me to interpret the Scripture like the Scripture for our day, like the Scripture interpreted their day. And what I mean by that is that Jewish people had that wonderful ability to look back and see the hand of God. Sometimes the hand of God came from people like Nebuchadnezzar. How in the world will we think that a Babylonian king could judge us? Habakkuk said that. How could this be? And yet, looking back, they could see how that brought them closer to God. And we often hear people who go through disasters say, you know, I've never felt closer to God than at this time. Now, that's not true for everyone. Some people go the other direction. But some of us don't receive what is judgment, that which is meant to bring us closer to God, to realize the limitations that we have, but that God is not limited. God is not limited. God is not limited by life and not limited by death to draw closer to God. Let me give you an example. I've been reading a book called 1493 by Thomas Mann, or listening to the book, 1493. And I 
gone with Jonathan on a field trip to Mississippi State this week with his uh, class, seventh grade class, and they'd gone to the GIS, the, the um, uh, Global Information Systems section of research that's done at Mississippi State. And I listened to Bill Cook make the presentation, and, and we both kept trying, looking at each other, trying to figure out how we knew each other. And then finally, at Ralph McLean's Friday night, we figured out, I saw him again, and we figured out where we knew each other, that I, I know his whole family. And he had just gotten out of college when I went to his church back in, or just gotten into college when I went to his church back in the early 1970s. Well, he's the head of the GIS unit, and they were talking about global information systems and how it collects information of all kinds. And I was, I was pretty amazed. I, I knew it as a title, but I realized I really didn't know what it did. I didn't know that it was used to pr project everything from West Nile virus onto global terror and, and uh, the most likely places for terrorist attacks. I didn't know that. So it was very interesting to me, and, and I was looking at that, and then I was listening to this book again, 1493, and I realized they were using global information systems to write the book to use information on the book, and it was quite fascinating. One, one part of it, they were talking about the impact of the earthworm coming into New England through the pilgrims moving into New England, how that in the southern part of America there were earthworms and, and the impact that they had on the environment. So it's quite, I know, you, I, I just thought you'd really like that piece of trivia. Uh, sorry, but uh, I know that's really not the thing that I got most fascinated about the book, but it got to a section on southern history. And, and I was fascinated by this. It was actually a study that I've done in the Middle East on malaria because malaria was that disease that killed most people in the cities. In fact, you could almost say for certain that in the Gospels, Peter's mother, who's suffering from a fever, is suffering from malaria. That was the number one cause of death in the cities in the Galilee in the time of Jesus. So I was listening to malaria in the colonies and how north of the Mason-Dixon line, there was almost no malaria. But south of the Mason-Dixon line, there was malaria. And, and here's the thing. In the story, it seems that the north, and I knew this from my studies in southern history because southern history was my emphasis growing when I was in school and my undergraduate work, is that when the north entered the war, against the secession of the South, it had one purpose in mind. And that purpose was to preserve the Union. They were fighting to preserve the Union. They had even told the Southerners that if they would lay down their arms and quit, that, th that all their institutions would stay intact, including slavery. Did you realize that? I knew that. From, so I wasn't surprised at that at all. What I was surprised about is how Robert Mann said that the North came to change its mind. It's that as the war lingered on through the mosquito infestation, which caused so many soldiers to die and others had to go in, and it caused such a weakness in the Northern armies that the war couldn't be won quickly under any circumstance, that one of the causes for that was the malaria. And it suddenly dawned on me, God had something bigger in mind. Now, you may not choose to read it like that, but I want to tell you, I do. God was not happy with slavery. God was not happy with the institution of slavery. God did not want us to live in that environment. And so slavery came to an end in some ways through the judgment of the mosquito. Now, that's not the entire story, obviously. But the mosquito made the war go on until... The North saw a different path and changed its mind. Now, we're Southerners, so we grew up to think that the war between the states was just the worst thing that, that ever happened, and that it was a war about states' rights, and I've heard all that all my life. But I want to tell you that God judges even good people. Judgment comes on everyone. It doesn't mean that everybody was bad. It means that some things we don't see clearly until judgment comes to us. You've heard me tell the story of Christmas, but I'll tell you again that when I was seven years old, 
And the boys came into my yard the year that, that we had Christmas and that I was told by my father that there wouldn't be any Christmas presents for me because we couldn't afford it, but my younger brother would get all the Christmas that we had. But it seemed like Christmas to me. There were stockings hanging on the, uh, on the mantel, and there was popcorn that we had strung to hang on a Christmas tree. And my dad had brought home a cigar box full of broken packages of ladyfingers, little firecrackers. And it felt, I mean, it was a wonderful Christmas for a seven-year-old boy. So I didn't know, I wasn't missing anything. But what happened that night changed my life. There were two boys that came through my yard. I'd seen them before. They rode makeshift scooters made out of apple crates and old roller skates. And I always wanted to do that. My parents wouldn't let me do it, and I didn't have any old ro roller skates. But they would ride by the house, and I would want to ride with them. And these two African-American boys came up in the yard in the 1950s. And so I'm looking at them and they watched me shoot firecrackers for a while and then they said, will you sell us some of those firecrackers? And those of you who've heard me tell that story, you know, I thought we needed money and I said, I'll do it. Have you got any money? And they pulled out what looked like a lot of money to me as a kid, but it was pennies and nickels. It was three dimes and a couple of quarters and I went for the quarters, but they didn't go for that. So I picked out the three dimes, and we agreed on the price. They took some firecrackers, and I went inside to show my dad. I thought he'd be proud of me. I thought he would feel good that we had money. After all, we needed money, right? Money's the big deal, right? And then I held out my hand and said, Look, Dad, I sold those boys some firecrackers. And that's when judgment came to me. My dad looked at me. And his eyes took on a look I'd never seen in his face before. It was a broken heart and sorrow. And he said, son, he said, you've got all the firecrackers you want. But that money is all the Christmas those boys will have. He didn't say any more. I didn't want that money. I took it and I ran outside as fast as I could. I wanted to give it back to them. I looked down the street and up. I looked everywhere I could, but there were no boys. They had gone. I don't know why. I, I don't know if they were afraid I wanted the firecrackers back. I don't know what it was, but they were gone. But I hated that 30 cents. I guarantee you, as a seven-year-old, I felt just like Judas with 30 pieces of silver. And I still remember that story. It was the first time in my life I'd been aware that there were those who had, and our having was meager, and those who did not. And I felt ashamed that I had not seen them before. There are other times in my life that that's taken place. It's not the only time it's happened. I wish I could say I learned enough to really see the world since then, but I've failed so many times. And when judgment and sorrow comes after we have failed, my goodness, my goodness, what a gift from God it is that we don't have to stand before the judge of life and face Almighty God and hear Him say, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. Thank God for judgment. Thank God for judgment that redirects our lives, that lets us become more like the Father. You remember the story of the silversmith who's refining the silver, but if he gets it too hot, if he overheats it, overcooks it, it'll ruin it. And they ask him, how do you know when it's ready? And he said, when I can see my reflection in the silver, it's purified. Now, that's true, isn't it? We are created in the image of God, and what God does for us in judgment is not to condemn us or kill us or destroy us, but rather to draw us closer to Himself, to make us more like the image that He created us in. It frustrates me at times because the church can be like some of the chickens I had when I was growing up. 
I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but chickens can be mean to each other. I, I was raising pullets at one time, and, and my pullets started pecking each other. In fact, they'd find one that had a little bloody spot on it, and they'd all gang up on that one, and they'd peck it literally till they killed it. And they'd peck it to death. Well, we called one of the uh, company veterinarians to ask them what might be the problem. And they said, well, it's probably missing some calcium and lime in their diet. Um, go get a bag of cracked seashells. So we did. We went and got some ground-up oyster shells and gave it to the chickens, and they quit pecking each other. I, I think sometimes we're missing something in our diet as God's people. We're missing something, so the only thing we have to do is kind of peck at each other, criticize, instead of focusing on who we are. We are God's people who have been given a great gift, not to keep for ourselves, but to give away, to share. That passage that we read today, the stranger, the stranger. Now, there are a lot of ways that you can treat strangers. You can be the man who ran the corner store and the fellow came in to buy a saddle blanket years ago for his horse and he said, I want the best blanket you've got. And he said, well, I've got a red, white, and blue one. And everybody sitting around knew that that red, white, and blue bank blanket had always been $2. For any one of the three, you take your pick. But this man was a stranger. And the store clerk quoted the scripture. And there had been a little child that had come in that morning when she did, gave her a change and said, blessed are the children. For to such as these belong the kingdom of God. And everybody smiled. They were expecting a verse. So they listened to see the conversation that was happening with a stranger. And he said, well, I've got that white blanket up there, and it's $2. He said, no, sir, I want your best blanket. And there was a little hesitation, and the clerk said, well, I've got the red one, and it's, uh, it's $4. And uh, he said, no, sir, I want your best one. He said, well, now the blue one's real expensive. He said, it's $12. It's going to cost you that to get it. He said, well, I'll take it. And so he took that $2 blanket and paid $12 for it. And all his friends were waiting to see what kind of Bible verse he was going to quote. And then he did. And he said, he was a stranger. And I took him in. <laughs> Sometimes we do that, don't we? We don't have to know who those people are. We can just act as if they don't exist. Oh my goodness. I don't know where it was. It was a medical school. And on the final exam for young residents, there was a question. Who is the woman that cleans the hall? What is her name on the floor where you've been serving? And if they couldn't answer that question, and give her name, they failed the exam. Some of the students who failed were furious. They went to the professor and to the dean and said, Look, this has nothing to do with medicine and the practice of medicine. It doesn't have anything to do with what we know about medicine. And the professor said it has everything to do with how you treat people. And that is what medicine is all about. But we sometimes can ignore those who pick up the plates at our table in a restaurant or sweep the floors in our church or our home. We can look right past them and not see them. I was a stranger. I was naked, I was hungry, I was in prison, I was sick. But I did that for those I knew. And Jesus said, you've got a bigger responsibility than that. You have a larger responsibility than that. Thank God for judgment.